my Carbagel Nation, welcome to another episode of the Micro Moment with your host, John. In many of our podcasts, we discuss the groundbreaking, the novel, and the edge of ingenuity that many researchers find themselves. But all this research is done typically wearing a single most important item of clothing, an item of clothing that is stereotyped scientists for at least a century. We, of course, are talking about the lab coat. But more importantly, we are talking today with a man who is trying to take and revolutionize the lab coat, giving researchers a bit more choice and pizzazz in their lab styling choice. Here with us today is a scientist turned entrepreneur, Dr. Derek Miller. Derek has a PhD in material science and engineering from Ohio State University, and his research has focused on specific areas including superalloys, aerogels, and semiconductors. He is now an R&D specialist in the semiconductor industry and is the creator of the website Genius Lab Gear that sells a plethora of scientific items, including pocket tools, magnets, stickers, art, and, as we have alluded to, soon lab coats. Welcome to the show, Derek. Thanks. Great to be here. So before we talk about your company, I wanted to see if you had experienced a micro moment. Can you tell us what your experience with microbial world is? Yeah. Well, like you said, I'm I'm a material scientist by training. So normally the microbial world is a little bit foreign to me, but I had a a run-in just a few months ago that really blew my mind. I got married to my wife back in September, and we took a vacation afterwards. And we went to Grand Cayman, an island kind of south of Cuba, and we wanted to kind of stay away from all the resorts and the busy areas. So we got a little Airbnb on this bay. And when we got there, we realized that somebody told us it was a bioluminescent bay. So we had a kayak with the Airbnb. And so one night we, we kind of went out there. We switched the paddle around a little bit in the water, didn't see much. But we, we decided to kayak out anyway because it was a nice night. And as we got to the really, really dark areas of this bay, it was a saltwater bay, the paddles started glowing in the water. Every time we paddled, it would just be this long streak of blue, shiny crystals almost that would light up the water. And then eventually we stopped. And if you just look straight down and you don't disturb the water at all, the little microorganisms in there, I think they're the dinoflagellates, they just sparkle on their own without being disturbed. And so it's very mesmerizing. You just stare into this like deep black water with these tiny, tiny sparkles. And then at one point, like we had a, a fish swim under us, like six feet under us, but the water was so clear. It was like a, a streak of blue underneath us. And then we had a flying fish in front of us that lit up the water across the top. And that just really blew my mind that, you know, these little microorganisms filled up this bay, they call this bay their home, and they make it so beautiful and such like a magical experience uh, at night. And, you know, those those bioluminescent bays are kind of disappearing around the world. And this one was really well preserved. And we did our best not to, you know, disturb it at all. So that was really my latest uh, and greatest magical experience with microbes. I have to say, I'm a little jealous. I've always wanted to see that and I haven't had the experience to. <laughs> you should definitely go. There's There's also one in Puerto Rico that's pretty easy to get to. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I'm going to have to make it a destination. Easy flights to San Juan. So microbes have a lot of superhero or super uh, villain qualities. As a scientist, we are constantly finding new functions in the microbial world. Do you have a favorite microbe or microbial function? What is it and why? Yeah, I think the research that I'm most excited about, and I'm sure there's a lot that I don't know about, but the one that I, I hear about that I, I really want to become a reality is using microbes for the decomposition of plastics. I know it's still pretty early research, but it, and it seems to work pretty well in a lab scale. Uh, I think they're trying to get it to more of an industrial scale. But they can either, either use the microbes directly to consume some of these plastics, or in some cases, I think they've been able to isolate enzymes that accelerate the decomposition. And I've traveled quite a bit around Latin America recently, and I've just seen so many beaches and coral reefs that are just covered in little bits of plastic films and bottles and things. And you know, a lot of that's from tourists, some of it's from the people that live there. And the problem is, you know, they don't necessarily generate more trash than we do in the United States, but they don't have good places to put it and they don't have good centralized trash and recycling programs that just whisk it off and and hide it from public view. So, you know, if this could become a technology that can be more distributed, more localized, I think it'd be awesome if instead of like a compost bin, you could also have a separate bin that you're seeding with these microbes or these enzymes to help decompose your plastics on a more local scale. That would be really cool. I also think they found a worm or a caterpillar that was breaking down plastic, and it turns out that the microbes in its gut were the reason why it was able to break down the plastics. 
Wow, that's awesome. It's like a symbiotic relationship again. Yeah. Uh, that would be really cool, like five or ten years down the road. Yeah, like we don't even have plastic bins. We just have, like you said, a compost bin out back where we just toss it. Yep, spin it around a few times a day and maybe a little heat and, and chemicals in there would be make it work. So let's shift to your website. Can you tell everyone a little bit more about it? What inspired you to make it? Yeah, sure. So I, I think you know, as long as I can remember, I've had this deep-seated need to make things more effortless. It's kind of the engineer inside of me. I'm the kind of person who will spend like an hour setting up a process that saves me 30 seconds a day. Uh, and I just really believe that some clever work up front can make our research easier and a little more fun. Uh, but our labs, especially the labs I've worked in over the years, they're typically not designed well for the people using them. They're more like where to put the equipment and where the the safety showers and the valves and, and they don't take into account the user experience as much as, as I think a lot of like medical labs and hospitals do, for instance. And I just, I truly believe that everyone can do amazing research if the lab environment will just get out of their way. Our labs don't have to be these like cold, dark, lifeless places. At least that's what my experience has typically been. They don't have to be a no fun zone. They should be comfortable, accessible for everyone. So I started Genius Lab Gear a few years ago to help fix this. At first, you know, I saw a few places in my lab where I could make little gizmos to help organize things, uh, especially like in a fume hood uh, where things tend to be kind of messy. I made some 3D prints that worked really well, but the cost for an injection mold were like $30,000. Wow. Uh, and I didn't have an audience. I didn't have like a real business at that point. So I had to kind of shelve that for the time being. And then I, I realized I was kind of frustrated with just like my ruler that I used at work. Uh, so I decided to set out to make the most amazing ruler a scientist or engineer could ever need. I wasn't very happy with the quality and the cost of the first few I made. They were too expensive. They didn't feel that great. So I decided to take a different approach and I made some kind of credit card sized uh, metal pocket tools instead, like the pocket chemist and the pocket engineer. Those took off and they really gave me the resources and helped form the business and gave me the audience and, and, and everything to go after some new problems. And we're also, we're actually working on a pocket microbiologist that we're going to try to launch this year as well. Then it kind of had the, had our feet under us. I started visiting local labs to look for new problems. And, and I found one uh, in a genomics lab that I visited at UNC. Someone was using random chunks of styrofoam to prop up a cell culture dish to pipette out the media because there's only a little bit left, right? So you kind of right. tilt it to, to collect it and, and be able to pipette it out. And that wasn't even the problem they were there to show me, but I just, I noticed this happening off to the side. And I said, you know, do you spill that often? Does that work very well? Oh yeah, we spill it all the time. A lot of times we have to start over. These things are very stable. And so I, I went and I designed some like angled culture plate holders. I 3D printed one for them. They tested it. They loved it. It gave a little bit of feedback. And I went and got a batch manufactured out of anodized aluminum instead of plastic. And then I went back to the lab a few months later, actually to deliver it and test out the final product. And the 3D print that I gave them was really just like, is this the right shape and size? It wasn't meant to be used because it's plastic and it's going to break down. And it was literally breaking down from constant use in the two months that I was gone. <laughs> really? <laughs> I asked where it was and they had to go find it because they said they were fighting over it daily and kept moving it back and forth around the lab. And so that's when I knew I solved a, a real problem in the labs. So I, I call those the culture caddies, try to be a fun name for, for cell culturing. And that's the kind of thing, that's something I'm really proud of. And that's the kind of problem I want to solve. So that just encouraged me even more to go out and try to solve these little problems just to make the day-to-day -day, you know, lab work even easier. That's really important. I'm not too experienced with cell culture, but you have to be very careful and meticulous when you end up mm -hmm. removing any media from it so you don't disrupt those cells. Exactly, exactly. And just to go back, I, I do wish when I was an undergrad, I had your chemistry pocket. Yeah, the organic chemistry. Central. Yeah, that would have saved me so much time because it has some of the most common chemical structures on it. Yeah, you and me both. I, I also did not have that when I was in organic chemistry. <laughs> Unfortunately, I made it about six years later. But making it happen for everybody else. That's what's important. So I was wondering if you could talk about the Better Lab Co project. Can you tell us a little bit about it and why is it important to you and what inspired its inception? Yeah, and so this, it's again, going back to what I said earlier about, I just want things to be effortless. I don't think the lab should get in your way. The Lab Co during my research and, and really undergrad and grad school was always something that got in my way. It always something that frustrated me just a little bit every single day. When I when I first went to grad school, you know, I had a fellowship. I, I had the whole thing figured out. I was really excited. Uh, the older grad students, they brought me into the lab, started explaining some things, showed me around. 
Uh, and I, I was just really excited that I was here to do some real research and I was right where I wanted to be. But then they, they gave me my lab coat and it wasn't really my lab coat. It was just the lab coat that they had in a box that somebody else no longer needed because they graduated and it was the only one that wasn't being used. So that was mine all of a sudden. And it was a large, but I'm usually medium. Uh, and somehow the sleeves were still too short. Uh, when I, especially when I reached the, like the most dangerous chemicals in the back of the hood, <laughs> I remember the the second day I was there, I caught my reflection. We had this big acrylic panel that enclosed some equipment. And I just thought like, is this what a scientist is supposed to look like? And I felt like a child actor from the 1950s who uh, dressed up as a ghost by just wearing a big white bed sheet, you know, over their head. Like that's <laughs> what I felt like wearing it. And I'm a pretty average built like white male. And so it shouldn't have been that hard for me to find a lab coat that fit, you know, in the grand scheme of things. And there are a lot of other people out there with a huge variation of body types. And it's even harder for all of them to find lab coats that fit them. And they have even more problems than I did day to day. So eventually in grad school, I just kind of stopped wearing my lab coat. You know, I put it on here and there when I got out the strong acids, when I, when I really needed it, but in general, I just didn't use it that much. And I definitely put myself at risk. Looking back, I feel like I was forced into a bad decision by the poor design of the lab coat. And that was almost 10 years ago. And the frustration never really went away. It always kind of sat with me in, in a bad way. And I just kind of moved on from it. But then fast forward, I had Genius Lab Gear was starting to thrive. I had more resources. I had a real business and audience. And I started thinking about like, can I do this? Can I make a new lab coat now? Now with everything I know. And I decided, no, I can't, at least not by myself. So I was I was driving on a really long drive during COVID um, because I didn't want to fly. And it hit me that maybe I couldn't do it, but maybe with about a thousand friends, uh, we could do it together. And so that's when I decided, why don't we crowdsource the design of a lab coat from scientists instead of me projecting what I think a scientist need, like, let's just ask them what they actually need. And so I built a survey uh, and then I went and tried to get all the data and the feedback that I could to try to actually solve these problems. Yeah, I'm circling back a little bit, I have to definitely say my lab coats, the sleeve length did not match my body type. Like I, <laughs> I was it like a, never does. a large XL, but yeah, my, my arms are always longer. And I had a professor who was very tall. And so he wore his lab coat. He may have been like a medium in his body builds, but because of his height, he had a 3XL lab coat. <laughs> yep. Everybody's always limited by whichever part of their body is the the widest, narrowest, longest, shortest. You know, they just have to pick for that. Right. So you mentioned that you got a thousand people crowdsourcing. How did you go about trying to get all these responses? Because that's a lot of engagement. Yeah, it, it is definitely a lot of engagement, but I, I really, I only instigated it. It took on a life of its own, really. When I started putting it out there, uh, the researchers, they got really fired up about it and they started to share it with their friends and colleagues. I started with an email to, to my email list for Genius Lab Gear, posted on Instagram and Twitter. That got us about halfway there, maybe to around 500. And eventually I got onto Reddit where people are very vocal. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I posted it on the Lab Rats subreddit, the Chemistry subreddit, the Microbiology subreddit. It was the trending post on both lab rats and microbiology subreddits for a few days. And the comments on those subreddit posts were amazing. Like people were really fired up about it. Tons of upvotes um, and people sharing ideas with each other and us going back and forth. I was you know, challenging their ideas and they were saying why they would work or why they wouldn't and, and just improving them in, in real time. And so with all of that, I could really tell that it was hitting a nerve. And now, so we got to a thousand in... October. And that was the goal to, you know, really get started on the project. And now we're actually closer to 1400. Because when we hit 1000, we started getting press attention too. Um, got picked up by chemistry world, even the, the Telegraph UK wrote an article about it. And then I was even invited on to the BBC World Science podcast. Uh, and the CBC, like the Canadian broadcast companies quirks and quirks podcast, which is a really long running science show. And so you can tell like, there's, there's a problem here uh, that people <laughs> are interested in and people, everybody knows it's a problem, but nobody knows how to, how to fix it. Right. I have to say, I don't know if I've ever had a lab coat that I could say was comfortable. Exactly. I want it to feel like, you know, you have your favorite hoodie or your favorite pair of jeans and that's, that's the dream, right? Right. Just throw it on and you feel good. So I believe most of your responses came from an academic labs and over 50% came from microbial related fields. 
But do you have a sense of how diverse these responses represent geographically, gender or otherwise? Yeah, a little bit. So I had to make sure the survey was already kind of long, so I didn't want to ask for a ton of very detailed demographic information because I wanted to focus on like what are the what are the problems. But a lot of that came out in the comments. People um, talked about their body types or this isn't available in, in my country. I can only find this or that. And so I, I do know it, it's, I think, about 56% women in the survey, and then about 4% were um, gender non-conforming. The rest were reported male. Over 50%, like you said, came from what we described as wet labs in life sciences. Uh, so that's a lot of your um, listeners. And geographically, my guess is roughly 60% in the United States, uh, maybe 30% in Europe. And then we have a bunch from Australia. We have uh, a lot from Latin America, some from Asia the Middle East, even pretty much all over the world. And so it's a problem that's all over the world. It's definitely not just for the United States. And it's also our intention to make these available to and ship to any country in the world too, because that's, you know, accessibility of the lab coats is one of the problems and you can't fix the problem if they can't, <laughs> if they can't get to it. It sounds like there's going to be a the supply and demand issue. There's too many people that are going to want these lab coats. <laughs> uh, well, that's a good problem to have. Were there any themes that came out of these responses? Like, were there any universal pain points of lab coats that people like commonly identified? Yeah, I, I mean, I spent several weekends really pouring through all the data and then especially all of the free form responses. People wrote these really passionate comments explaining their situations. And what we found was really striking. And it was that scientists come in all shapes and sizes, but but lab coats don't. And that's really the core problem. And, and that's the heart of it. Specifically, curvy women and petite women, they had the most problems. Curvy women consistently said that their lab coats were too big, uh, but only too big in some areas, kind of like, like what you described earlier. They were tired of wearing lab coats, especially unisex lab coats are really just designed around men. And they have a cylindrical shape and they don't conform to a curvy body at all. Right. So if the widest part of their body is their hips or their chest and the lab coat is a cylinder, then they have to order up several sizes to fit the widest point of their body. So that leaves the lab coat uh, much too big at either the waist or their shoulders or, or wherever is smaller than the widest part of their body. And then petite women kept saying that the smallest size they could find <laughs> made them, like literally four people said, feel like a child playing dress up. <laughs> that was the sentiment. The small typically wasn't small enough. And some of them even tried kid sizes, but these weren't really designed for professional work. And they made them feel like they're not an adult in the lab. And then some of the other frustrations were around some of the technical features, which is, you know, what I really started the project around, I was more concerned with the technical features until all of this really hit me about how big of a problem it was for fit and especially for women and how deep of a problem it became. But as far as the technical problems, most researchers keep a lot of utensils in their breast pockets. Mm -hmm. And so when they bend over, a lot of them said it just spills out all over the floor. So we really need, you know, tighter, more defined pockets for pens and markers and things. So they don't fall over, fall out everywhere out of the floor. <laughs> most wanted a dedicated phone pocket separate from where they store their lab items. Um, so like ideally on the inside where they can keep their phone clean, but they still have it on them for when they need it. Uh, roughly four out of five researchers wanted knit cuffs. This was kind of a vote that I put to everyone. Do you want knit, knit cuffs or straight cuffs? Um, but most wanted knit cuffs to keep their, their wrists protected. So many microbiologists, especially when they're working with cells, they roll their sleeves to prevent contaminating their cells because it's such a big problem. But ideally we just would have sleeves that don't get in the way, sleeves that don't hang down that much. And so you could maybe taper the sleeve and use a knit cuff and just keep it much more slim to your forearm so that it doesn't dip into your cell culture dish. Right. And then a few other random things that were just kind of universally needed. Most people wanted snaps, metal snaps instead of buttons. They're easier to get out of quickly if you're on fire or in, if Chipotle closes in like 20 minutes, you also need to get out of there really <laughs> fast, right? You don't want to be messing with your buttons. A lot of people wanted side vents to access their inner pockets. Something really important would be a belt to pull in the waist to get a better form fit. And then just universally, everybody wants more pockets, right? More pockets are... I really want to find like how many pockets is too many. Is it seven? <laughs> is it nine? Is it, is it just 20 pockets too many? Everybody needs more space for their markers, the pens, just so that they have everything they need on them at all times. And that just makes your day-to-day -day work so much easier when everything is right there where you need it and well-organized. Right. Almost sounds like uh, creating a utility lab coat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically. 
So is there any other funny or surprising anecdotes that you saw with the responses you got? Yeah. Some of the funniest comments were actually also the most emotional ones. They're the people that were the most frustrated with the problem. They kind of rolled into one. And the thing that really surprised me the most about the data was how much it can affect someone's mental health while they're working. And that's something that I didn't think too much about until I started really reading these comments. And again, most of that comes from curvy women and petite women, but it, it touches just about everybody in, in some way or another. So I, I can read a, a couple of these comments if you want. I actually, I, I wrote a special article just about this problem because I had so much information on it from the survey. Um, I put it up at geniuslabgear.com slash mental health. If anybody wants to go read all of the quotes, there's about 20 in there plus some other data. But I can share a few excerpts just to kind of get, get the point across. One issue was that the poorly fitting lab coats, they often leave women feeling like their look is unprofessional, especially compared to their male colleagues. One woman said, every lab coat I've had so far has somehow been both too big and too small and horribly uncomfortable. It frustrates me to see others wearing coats that make them look cool and professional. Meanwhile, I'm over here looking like an ancient Roman who got kicked out of the fashion show. <laughs> so. I like that one a lot. Another woman said the snaps, they bust open if I move around because of my shape and the fact that at least one part of my lab coat will be hugely loose, knocking things over as I attempt to be careful. It has made me look incompetent so many times. And then another theme that emerged was um, a lot of other women said more directly how poorly fitting lab coats affect their self image and their confidence. Uh, if you think about it, like how often would you want to go into the lab? if your uniform made you feel bad about yourself every single day. That's something that that really hit me as I read these. So one woman said, the size range seems to accommodate a pretty limited range of close to average size men. As a very short woman, I wear an extra small lab coat and I'm completely swamped by it in length arms, excess material, too deep a V at the neck. It isn't convenient to wear in the lab and it makes you feel like a fraud when you look more like a kid in a fancy dress than a professional at work. Nothing screams, you don't belong more than having to wear a comically ill-fitting piece of major uniform every day because no one considered a person like you could need one. That is something that just really hits hard about how can you go to work and do a good job every day when when you feel like that. That kind of ties into, I know I feel it sometimes, and I know a lot of people do, is you, especially when you start, you get a sense of imposter syndrome especially mm -hmm. when you start a new Everybody. job. And I, I feel like that would only compound that feeling even more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I can add one one more quote to your comment. Uh, a petite woman said, um, being swallowed by a giant lab coat makes you feel like you are dressing up in a costume. It creates a strange imposter syndrome that whispers in your ear, you're not a real scientist. Exactly what you said. So to pivot a little bit, uh, you said that there are about 1,400 responses now. Does that mean the survey is still going on? Yeah. And honestly, I don't think we'll ever close it. The more data we get, the more we can precisely address problems in different fields. So right now it's, you know, maybe 50% the biosciences, it's roughly 40% in chemistry. As we collect more data, we can really narrow in. Maybe there's a certain lab coat design that's best for chemists. And maybe there's a certain lab coat design that's best for people in dry labs in physics or working with lasers or you know something else like that in different environments and we also need more data in the fringes of height and weight so anybody who has like a non-average body type we, we really need a lot more data there so that we can make sure the lab coats fit really well for everybody not just you know the mediums and the larges of the world and so I, I want to get to 2,000. I want to get to 10,000 if we can. And I think as we start selling the lab coats, I think we'll actually get more responses from other colleagues and, and friends of the people that buy them. I think you pretty much covered this question, but is there anything else that you can think of, like an additional function your lab coat will offer that is not found in traditional lab coats other than, you know, this comfort form fitting lab coat? Yeah. So the one thing that I mentioned it briefly before, but it might sound underwhelming, but it's the belt. So <laughs> I I bought and tested like 20 different popular commercial lab coats that are available right now. Maybe five of them had a belt and three of them, it was just a decorative belt that <laughs> didn't actually do anything. And the other two had like one button and it hung awkwardly off the back and it didn't, it just tightened it like a little bit like you would with maybe a, a vest that you might wear. 
and it didn't really work and it can catch on things in the back and it looks really awkward. And so what we did is we built a tube on the inside of the lab coat and stitched the belt into it. And on both sides, you can tighten the belt up to five inches on both sides. So you can, you can pull in the coat up to 10 inches at the waist with a hidden belt. It keeps the back flat and it all scrunches on the sides kind of in neat ripples. And so it actually keeps like a really clean look. And just by adding a functional belt, which seems really obvious, I know, but nobody else has done this. It fixes a ton of those fit problems. So all of a sudden, it doesn't matter if you're more curvy in your hips or up in your shoulders or chest you could pull that waist in and still have something that is form fitting. And so that makes, that makes more sizes work for more people, uh, along with the knit cuffs, which kind of act as a buffer for sleeve length. Those types of things I think will make a huge difference on their own. Never heard of a, that style of belt, but it sounds really cool because like you said, you don't want something caught in the back, like a vest or look awkward, like a robe. Exactly. Yeah. I, I kind of think we invented a new type of belt <laughs> in the <laughs> prototyping, but uh, yeah, it works really well so far. I've, I've tried it a bunch of times. So will these lab coats be tailored to specific science areas? Because I know like chemistry, you want a more fire resistant lab coat. And sometimes with microbiology, you want a lighter, more breathable. Yeah. And so I've spent hours and hours and hours learning about lab coat materials. That's a really big, important part. And I also included that in one form in the survey. And the first lab coat we're going to make is going to be 100% cotton. And that is because that is the most requested, the most needed, and the most likely to conform to most laboratory safety standards. So the first one is meant to get out there as much as possible and, and improve people's lab coats as much as possible even though it might not be the perfect solution for every single person. And the 100% cotton is going to be the most breathable for sure. And it keeps you pretty warm in the winter. Uh, it can keep you cool in the summer at the same time. And then we've also looked at and evaluated a lot of FR materials, flame retardant materials uh, that can be needed and necessary. And sometimes in a lot of chemistry labs, those are a little bit more expensive. So the plan is, you know, kind of use this first version to really nail the design. We'll get a bunch of feedback too from when we start selling it and see if there's any tweaks we need to make and then come out with an FR version. And then I'd also like to come out with a version that has a higher content of polyester. So polyester is usually feels cheaper. It, it's flammable, it can melt to your skin. You don't wanna use it around uh, flames and it's also not as breathable. But a lot of people working like in BSL2 laboratories, for instance, often need a higher polyester content because it does a better job of protecting against biological contamination. And so we'd like to have three, maybe four different materials available in the end, but we have to start with the crowd pleaser, which is 100% cotton. Makes sense. So I know there's a lot of demand for this. So when and where can these people find these new lab coats? Yeah, uh, the when is is a great question. So Right now, what we're doing is we have 30 beta testers and they're all going to get early prototype lab coat. We'll take all that feedback, really try to lock in the design and then launch the pre-order. And so the pre-order will probably start late March, early April of 2023. And to go there, you go to geniuslabgear.com slash LCP for lab coat project. That's the landing page. So there, um, if the pre-order is not ready yet, you can leave your email to get onto the pre-order list to be notified. You can also go and find the form that you can fill out, put it, put in your own feedback of what you think a lab coat should, you know, our new lab coat should be like. And we'll, we review that data roughly monthly. Um, and you can also find all the data we talked about, all the quotes, the articles, everything else that we've figured out about lab coats so far, it all lives there. So geniuslabgear.com slash LCP pre-order should start yeah, sometime in April. And then from the time we meet the pre-order goal, so we have to sell 300 lab coats of male or female or both to be able to start the manufacturing. And so that's the big hurdle. If we can get to 300, we will run the manufacturing, which is a thousand of each gender. Uh, and then those will be available roughly four to five months after we start the manufacturing run. So we're looking at roughly fall of 2023, if we can get the pre-order to go quickly. And so that's the goal. And we just really need, you know, word of mouth from everybody out there to, to help spread this project and really make it a success. So before we end, is there anyone that you would like to thank? Yeah, absolutely. My my wife is a, a full-time resident physician and she is crazy busy constantly. 
but she is so supportive of me spending a lot of time on this. She lets me bounce ideas off of her to the point where most people get tired of me just constantly talking about all these, you know, crazy things I'm doing. And she's been just very supportive at all times of, of me spending all of my extra time on these, these kinds of endeavors. She really believes in it. And uh, she says she is, she's the idea guy really behind, behind the whole business. So I'd like to credit her for all of my best ideas. Who knows more about lab coats than physicians too. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So where can people reach you? Uh, yeah. So you can go to uh, at geniuslabier.com. There's a bunch of places to sign up for a newsletter, but feel free to send me an email directly. I send emails out uh, monthly to that newsletter list from uh, Derek, D-E-R-E-K, at geniuslabgear.com. We also have an Instagram account, which is just Genius Lab Gear, Twitter, Genius Lab Gear, Pinterest, TikTok, pretty much everything available on all of that. And, and we're pretty active on Instagram and Twitter, trying to get a little more active on TikTok too. I uh, got to work on my dance moves a little bit more still there. <laughs> Well, thank you for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. This was fun. Well, Microbial Nation, that's our episode today. I hope you enjoyed our interview with Derek Miller. And if you enjoyed it, check out his website, GeniusLabGear.com. That is G-E-N-I-U-S-L-A-B-G-E-A-R, where you can find a lot more than what we talked about, including science art. If you want more information about the Lab Code Project, visit GeniusLabGear.com slash mental health and GeniusLabGear.com slash LCP. Find Derek's company on Twitter and Instagram by searching GeniusLabGear. As for us, you can find us on Twitter and Instagram as well by searching at Microbigales. You can also visit Microbigales.com to check out more content, including our blog and more episodes of your favorite podcast. That's M I C R O B I G A L S.com can also reach out to us on these platforms or by emailing microbigales at gmail.com. We're always happy to hear from you and welcome any comments or suggestions. Stay tuned as we are busy and have more episodes that are in the works. But don't forget everyone, feed your microbes, feed your guts, make your microbes love you lots. Bye!